explore with Dr. Hiroshan exactly where does desalination fit in the larger space of sustainable development. Now, Hiroshan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shama. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you all see it? Yeah. Now it's good. Now it's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, um, a good day to all of you. Um, I had to tell you, I, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. I am in Michigan. My time zone is far away from uh, many others. I had a lot of coffee, but it's not helping. And uh, my energy is not at where it should be, but I will try my best to uh, motivate you <laughs> with the little energy I have. Um, 20 minutes, my clock is 8.42. I started at 8.41. So um, I think I have 20 minutes. It's probably not enough to talk about a lot of things um, related to these uh, two words, sustainable development and the role um, desalination can play in, in it. Uh, I just want to recap some of the things that was um, said um, in the previous two sessions. Uh, you can see this, uh, the drop in the energy cost of the uh, desalination uh, uh, using many technologies and mostly it is reverse osmosis now. It's a, it's a drastic drop and it, it, it is keep going down. On the other hand, um, the right hand side picture is more like the uh, the acceptability um, shown by the growth of desalination usage throughout the world. So it's very clear, it, it is promising. But now the question is, where would you put it? Um, well, I mean, this is a very nice cartoon that I found on the internet. Uh, are you gonna keep it on the left-hand side or are you gonna keep it on the right-hand side or is it still on the left-hand side? Can we? move to the right-hand side and make it part of the sustainable development strategy. And uh, to do this discussion, I decided to um, go for three stories in, in very brief. I picked three places uh, for some obvious reasons. Uh, let me go from left to right, California. I, uh, more specifically, I'll be looking at the San Diego County in California. And I, uh, in the previous session, I briefly mentioned that reverse osmosis technology was first, well, I think it was invented and piloted in California. And also, San Diego area is well known for um, membrane technology um, industry. And in the middle, it's Saudi Arabia, um, the largest producer of desalinated water in the world. And the third country is Singapore. You cannot even see the country it's a very small island in asia but it is well known for it is its um, strategic planning um, uh, on um, water infrastructure and uh, all their water related programs so um i don't know if you can see the right hand side of the okay all right um San Diego County in, in California, this is the map of uh, San Diego, uh, California, and this tiny bit here is the San Diego County. The, the city of San Diego is in this county too. Now, um, because of the limited time we have, let me just directly bring you into here. 1991, this is how their water portfolio looked like. And by now, this is how it looks like. So, I mean, I don't expect you to read all these to understand what color means what, but I'll, I'll try to walk you over uh, the important ones. The point is 1946 was the last year San Diego County had enough water found in its locality uh, to uh, satisfy its local demand. And then they started importing water from the other parts of uh, um, the region. And first from the Colorado River, you can see somewhere here. 
and then northern part of the part of California later on. And that was the story. This yellow is actually the water that came from other parts in the region. And until 1991, there was a story. Only 5%, this light blue color is, um, you, as you can see here, that's the local um, surface water. And interestingly, they were able to increase this locally available percentage to 10% by 2020. How did that happen? It's mainly because of their um, way of storing uh, stormwater in um, reservoirs. Uh, they increased the reservoir capacity to um, catch the, the stormwater and then contain it in, in, uh, in reservoirs. And not only that, they also looked at, um, you can see this purple, two purple colors, light purple and the dark purple. Uh, these are water recycling options. One is going all the way to the potable level and the other one is for other type of uh, reuses. But both are um, recycling options or recycling. And interesting enough, this is a desalination giant. They have the technology, they can afford it too. Um, they are only depending on desalination to satisfy 10% of their demand. And I'm not going to talk about all these, but these colors, the other colors actually do represent a different type of uh, um, water borrowings or water that they import from uh, uh, different uh, other parts of the region. Um, now, Let's look at the second example, Saudi Arabia. Um, it's um, not only the largest manufacturer of desalinated water in the world, and if I'm not mistaken, it's probably the first one too. Their desalination actually started more than a century ago. Reverse osmosis was not uh, in the world arena, so they were using uh, basic distillation uh, methods. And if you look at the water portfolio quickly, you can still understand this is the largest manufacturer of desalinated water, but in their water portfolio, desalinated water is only less than 5%, close to 5%. And uh, so it is still very much diversified too. I'm not gonna say um, whether they are all sustainable or not, but uh, this is a fact. Um, and interesting enough, the Green color is the treated wastewater usage. Um, they probably started this later on, but I, well, I mean, by looking at the number of publications we see from uh, Saudi Arabia, there is a, a growing interest on uh, wastewater recycling uh, for at least for agricultural purposes by now. Um, the third one is Singapore. I think, uh, uh, Jairaj talked about Singapore too um, in the morning, um, in, in the first session. Now, the, the reason why I wanted to talk about Singapore is they are, uh, the way they methodically planned um, this whole process. It started back in 1970s. Uh, being an island country, they realized that they have to work on this aspect if they, if they want to become uh, independent. And uh, I mean, um, they have to be uh, in the, uh, they have to be um, water they cannot depend on some other countries uh, to satisfy their water demand because actually they started with uh, an agreement with Malaysia to take water. If you look at their water portfolio, this is what it means by imported water. And uh, the other fact is this tiny island, actually has about 17 reservoirs. They, they do the same by uh, trying to retain the, the stormwater in these 17 reservoirs. So you can see these blue areas on this map, they are the, uh, the small reservoirs. And then the other part is desalinated water. So if you look at this timeline uh, put out by the uh, PUB of Singapore, uh, by 2003, they started actually um, 
offering this uh, new water uh, explained by Jairaj. I don't have to get into details of new water, which is essentially the um, treated wastewater, which is actually, which exceeds the, uh, uh, the standards, WHO standards for uh, drinking quality uh, level water. So that was the first thing they accomplished. And then by 2005, they started um, working on the uh, desalinated water. Now, new water, which is the recycled uh, wastewater, is at 40% in their portfolio, while desalinated water is at 30. And if you look at their plan for 2030, they still want to keep the desalinated uh, part at 30, cap at 30, but they do want to increase this um, water recycling up to 50%. Now, very quickly, what can we learn from their stories? I can make, uh, I was able to make uh, three observations. One is clearly visible. You probably have seen it uh, in the talks of the, the other speakers too. The other one, the second observation is partly visible. The third one is where I really have to put an emphasis because it's to me, it was invisible until I started digging uh, deep down into the facts. Now, the visible fact is these three countries, these three communities are well-to-do. They are technologically savvy and they are economically well-to-do too. But look at their portfolios. All three, they are still diverse. Even though they can afford desalination, their desalination percentage is still limited to a certain fraction. It's uh, quite high in Singapore for obvious reasons because they don't have a whole lot of things they can do, um, but it is diverse. It's only one option in a portfolio. The second fact is it's partly visible. All three countries are actually putting effort into uh, recycling and water con uh, conservation. Because I touched upon water recycling before, I'm not gonna talk about it, but let's talk about water conservation. Now, there's one thing I can quickly show you. Well, pardon me for showing this uh, unusual unit. TAF is a thousand acre feet. We are still using imperial units in the United States. But f forget the unit, but just look at the total they have used in 1991. Look at the total they have used in 2018 and look at the total they have used in 2020. It has gone down 578, 518. Um, I mean, now it is increasing, but it is still less than what it was in 1991. This is thanks to the water con uh, conservation efforts. Basically, they are doing it uh, with the help of regula regulatory measures, education, and also introducing uh, incentives. Uh, per capita use of water in the States is very high, including California. I think uh, if you convert it to the, the uh, uh, liters, it's like 320 to 340 liters uh, a day. But still, um, we have to appreciate these kind of efforts because they're they are actively considering it as an uh, option. Now, if you look at Saudi Arabia, their water uh, per capita consumption is uh, not as high as in the States, but it is the third largest in the country. Um, they are trying to reduce it from 263 to 200 liters. And by 2030, they want to bring it down to 150, mainly through water conservation efforts. Uh, Singapore is already, they were already doing a good job even back in 2000, year 2000, uh, 165 liters, but this is how it has gone down, excuse me, um, and they still want to bring it down by another 10 liters or so. So uh, again, these are countries with desalination technologies, but they're very much into water con conservation uh, options. Now, the third one, is the tricky one because, um, I mean, everything looks okay from the surface, um, but what happens to the water after we release it to the, well, let's call it the national grid or the water system. Now, this is essentially a factory, right? Uh, any, like any other production process, 
we get raw material, we put energy, and then we produce something. In this case, it's fresh water, and there is a byproduct, some waste material too. So we are so busy uh, at um, we are looking at the energy and this waste brine production. We are so busy um, with these two. And when we hear about the energy cost, the drop in energy cost, and also when we hear about some innovative methods to uh, take care of waste brine, we're very happy. We clap and walk away with good feeling. Um, but is it a complete picture? Perhaps not. So let me just take you to um, this cycle. This is what I usually use to explain my, um, when I talk about circular economy, I use this cir circle to explain the material flow, how it flows. And uh, so, I mean, forget about this desalination, any water processing method, any water treatment process, you take it from the nature and then you make it uh, usable. You make fresh water out of that. And then we use it and what happens next is more, more important. I put a red line here. Um, what happens after is a little bit of re uh, water is recycled uh, for various purposes, mostly in agriculture, but a lot is just released to the uh, environment. But the problem here is, do you see this? According to the latest data, 50% of the wastewater is released to the environment untreated, nothing whatsoever. And the most scary part of it, part of this equation is, we see some recycling here, but even that is untreated. So many developing countries use untreated wastewater for irrigation. It's done with a good purpose, but done in a bad way. So why am I talking about this? And which is really quite common to all type of water manufacturing processes. Why am I trying to single out desalination when everything is in the same back basket and they all are trying to follow the same process? The problem is, um, Whenever there is there's something becoming cheaper, it can be a technology or a process or anything, uh, we have a tendency as a human to grab onto this because there is a, a temporary moment that we can benefit from and then we forget what happens later. I can uh, give you an example. Plastics is one of the best examples for this because and in 1950s, when high density polyethylene was invented, we were very happy. And uh, even the person who invented the process, I don't remember his name, but I think he was given a Nobel uh, Prize for chemistry for his invention back in 1963. Uh, high density polyethylene is very useful. And later it came into the plastic bag market. As a kid, I didn't see, uh, when I was six years old, that was the first time I saw a plastic bag. And then we know what happened um, on a global scale. We could not control it. Now we are seeing uh, the, the after uh, effect or the, the, the adverse effect of uh, getting plastic into our life. So um, desalination definitely offers an opportunity. But the problem here is the disconnect here. Production, water production is just like any other production. We are actually trying our um, very best to push all manufacturers to go with the extended um, producer responsibility because the minute they sell it, the, the responsibility should not go away. They have to take some responsibility of the waste flow too. It doesn't happen with water. I mean, uh, it can be desalination or any other type, but it doesn't happen with water because mostly because of the policy structure, the governance structure, because up until here, uh, it's mainly a combination can be private sector or government sector, but this part is mostly, mostly handled by the government, the municipalities uh, and so on. Um, so this can be a danger 
um, the price drop might not be a blessing if we are not looking at the entire life cycle and if you are not eager to take care of the waste product. Now, just to connect the dots back, let me take you back to the, the three stories I was talking about. Um, so how does it happen in the three places we were talking about, wastewater collection and treatment? Singapore being a, a city state, it is, um, it's quite possible it's 100% they treat and co collect and treat. California, uh, San Diego uh, County, I was talking about San Diego County. Well, I mean, I'm not really sure about the rural area, but it's uh, very close to 100%. What's the case for Saudi Arabia? The, the best uh, um, piece of data I could find was 37%. I have to admit it's uh, 10 years old. This reference is 10 years old. I'm pretty sure it has gone up, but it cannot be magically going up to 100%. So what is the difference here? While California and Singapore, uh, I mean, while all three countries are high income countries, Saudi Arabia is still a developing country. And this is quite common to all uh, or most of the developing countries, you can very well see it in this diagram too. While this is 90% um, for North America and 66 for Euro, by the way, the data uh, was actually collected in uh, year 2000. So these numbers are uh, not up to date, uh, but this reflects what we have um, mostly in Africa, Asia, and the, uh, the South America. So um, what I want to tell you is um, desalination, uh, I'm almost, almost wrapping up, desalination um, can be a good opportunity. We, we should benefit from it. But do we really take it in the right way? I mean, if you really want to take it in the right way, um, you have to work on what you have already because Desalination is all about getting a new source. It's a new, you're introducing a new volume of water, but we haven't capitalized on optimizing what we already have. Wastewater is already there. I mean, if you're talking about a city, you collect wastewater, you can benefit from that. And water con conservation is something we can benefit from too. It's there. Uh, so you have to understand um, the difference between the development and the sustainable development. Um, desalination can be very well uh, helpful in development, but it's up to us to decide whether we should be using it for development or sustainable development. Um, I think with that, I think I'm done with my 20 minutes too anyways. Um, I don't have to read. I, th this is basic takeaway that was that you have seen uh, in my last uh, three to four slides. Um, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very, very much, Hiroshan. Uh, from the chat, I can see that uh, you have touched upon a number of points uh, that uh, people lauded you for. Uh, there are there is one minor clarification. And there is another question coming from UK in Nigeria. The minor clarification question, and uh, Dr. Jaud also answered it a little bit. They were just surprised that Saudi Arabia had any groundwater to start with, because we have always heard of it as a desert and so forth. Yeah. So where does it come from? That's a clarif clarificatory question. Then uh, First, we'll hear your answer to that. Then I will go to the new case question. Yeah, very, very well. I, that's a good question. I, I was uh, sort of rushing through the slide because I didn't, we didn't have uh, enough time. And uh, I mean, uh, I've been to Saudi Arabia, but I, I, I don't want to say that I'm an expert in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, this is what they have, except this blue color region, they, what they call is the Southern Shield, is the only place in Saudi Arabia where they can be close to uh, having something like uh, self-sustenance uh, with water, with uh, rainwater. Uh, because Saudi Arabia is the largest country in the world that has no rivers or uh, large reservoirs. It's in the arid zone. But 
you can still tap on to uh, tap into your groundwater. So uh, while the two coastal areas are busy uh, taking desalination, um, vast majority in the middle region, they are actually still using groundwater for agricultural purposes. Uh, but in some areas here, if I'm uh, if I remember right, including even the capital Riyadh, uh, they take a, a lot of uh, uh, desalinated uh, seawater. Uh, there is a I think like. 400 kilometer long pipeline that takes uh, desalinated water from uh, this area to the capital. So that, that's a very brief explanation of uh, the, the sources they have, their, their water portfolio. Uh, Shama, you said you, you already had yes. another question too, yeah? The okay. UK asks, uh, at, a, at an international level, what are there any regulations for uh, extended responsibility of producers uh, in terms of wastewater, because much of the wastewater is being used for agricultural purposes. Is it safe? Do you know of anything where, you know, either good things or bad things have happened? Because whose, whose responsibility is it for the quality of the wastewater diverted to agriculture? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, uh, what some, one thing you had to understand is this is not like the nuclear waste. You're, you're right, it is a type of waste, but it's not like nuclear waste. For a nuclear waste, it's a very touchy topic. So we have an international a governing body actually under uh, the United Nations. Wastewater is not that kind of a topic, but at least not yet. So it is mostly up to the local environmental authorities and the uh, other, um, other authorities. It can be local, federal level, or uh, even the municipalities level. There is no universal law that we can apply to. Um, okay, so the other part of the question is, um, people are using wastewater. I'm trying to uh, get to something that I can use. Uh, perhaps not, it's okay. Um, a, a lot of countries are benefiting from wastewater um, for two reasons. One is, um, it's just water. I mean, it's wastewater, but it is a type of water. And in many places, that's the only type of water they can find. So that satisfies the water demand. The other reason is it has, when it is not treated, the, the nutrients are actually helping you to cut down the fertilizer use. So people like that. And so it has become a habit in, in some parts. And even if you try to teach them how to do it in a little better way, they don't agree because, okay, I do not have money to buy fertilizer. So this has become a bigger problem than we can think. So it is, it should be the responsibility of a local government or even a federal level government to put together some sort of a structure uh, not to let it happen because I, I can very well uh, explain from my own uh, experience. Um, we have done some work in, in uh, Mexico. There is one part called, uh, uh, um, th there is a certain part very close to the uh, Mexico city, like 160 kilometers. El, north El Paso, of, no? Uh, not, not El Paso, uh, 160 kilometers north of, uh, it is in the province of Hidalgo. Uh, they actually started wastewater about 120 years ago. Back then it was sort of harmless, but the, even the composition of the wastewater has evolved back uh, since then. Now, uh, the highest rates of cancer is being reported in this area just because of that practice. So the government is actually actively trying to do some things by trying to introduce uh, different type of uh, wastewater treatment technologies uh, before they can release it to the, the farmland. Uh, this is only one example, and uh, there are many countries that we haven't even heard because it's not basically in the literature. Uh, and in some countries, you're taking water from streams, you're thinking you're taking natural water, but essentially what you're taking out of a stream is wastewater too. So that's an indirect type of wastewater irrigation. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on, but I, I know we have a limited time. If you have other type of questions, I, will, I would be happy to uh, answer if we have time. 